everybody, welcome to Graphic Visualization. Uh, today, it's kind of a cool lecture. We're going to talk about parameters. We're going to talk about materiality and kind of opening up theory to how to start the creative process. So a big part about what we're doing now is we're breaking down the creative process to a granular level to think about the elements that are involved. And uh, we're doing that by a pamphlet that I kind of put together. Um, I have some extra material too, if you guys are curious that I've been working on recently that I could share with you guys later, or could be maybe a side discussion. Um, but it's something that uh, both Josh and I have thought about a lot as far as trying to figure out ways to help people go from a blank piece of paper to a design or from the opposite, from the design and then uh, to be able to articulate it and write about it and understand what they did or even other people's designs and look at it and kind of uh, break those down and break down the elements of those people's work. So one of the big things and big nodes of doing that are parameters and, and I'll open up this uh, PowerPoint that I have to start discussing that. By the way, like one of the genesis of the idea of this, which sounds kind of radical, but for a very long time, people were saying that the unique element of, about the humans, about human species, is our ability to be creative. And as somebody who's designed stuff, uh, I felt that that wasn't necessarily accurate. I think that robots can be just as creative as humans actually, but yet it's just the algorithm that they use in order to figure out what creativity is. And both Josh and I do spend a lot of time trying to think about creativity, what makes us creative and what makes an idea creative. And uh, so that's what this is. It's kind of breaking things down to think about what are the elements of an idea and how do we get those elements? And then how do we fuse those elements together to create something that's more complex with meaning? And the start of that is called the language of parameters, the creative process for visual designers. And the first part is discovery of data points. So when we get into a routine, we execute activities through a sequence with, we execute activities through a sequence with little thinking. There's over 1 billion cars in the world. Focus for a brief moment on the initial steps of the drivers around the world moving their cars. And uh, this is a cat backing stuff up in the morning to drive their car. And at that point, when we're thinking about people who are leaving their house to get into their car, we're starting to analyze what are the data points? What are the elements that go into an evolved species like us to be able, without even thinking, to get up, walk out the door, go to our car, back the car up, and get onto the highway and start driving away. It's actually quite a complex process that we do without really thinking about all the different things that we're doing at one point in order to make that happen. For example, reaching into the pant pocket or purse full of objects, that are part of the daily transport, which is wallet, chewing gum, coins, perhaps a pen, sifting through those items with tactile navigation to find the keyless remote, feel for the unlock button on the keychain with the keyless door lock and press the unlock button on the external remote in order to do that. And then the sequence of the average car owner backing up. So walking to the door, the car door one reaches to the handle of the door, moves their body slightly out of the way as the door swings by. The driver eases into the seat of the car. The driver reaches around their body and feels for the seatbelt, dragging the seatbelt across their body to snap it securely into place. Without inspecting the exact location, the driver locates the ignition area behind the steering wheel, turns the key and starts the car. With the engine running, drivers update the volume and music preferences in a sequence of spinning knobs and pushing buttons. So after that, in preparation for moving the car, the driver quickly assesses the area around the car for visual, visual, visible obstacles, a quick survey of the rear view mirror for the objects behind the car, a survey of the left and right mirrors for objects that may be on the side of the car, 
And then the driver is now consciously aware that the areas around the car are clear of obstacles. The driver's attention focuses on movement with the change of gears and into reverse. And then the right foot feels for the brake pedal, pushes down and then slowly releases as the car moves in reverse. And the sequence continues as the driver backs up and transitions to driving away. So first of all, this is something that is heavily being researched by a lot of these autonomous car companies, right? Where they have to break this down so that it can be automated the process. Uh, I believe, I'm not sure which car company it is, but one of them is able to do parallel parking by just pushing a button, which is amazing, right? And so they've broken down the process of first principles of how to actually parallel park in the first place. And then they try to automate that by a series of sensors around the car in order to move it into space. So the tasks list listed above occur within two or three minutes of time. And it's remarkable at the amount of activities or data points the driver is accomplishing in a short period of time. Uh, and the point is, is every one of those steps can be a value or a parameter that can be discovered and analyzed and somehow are equated to some other purpose or some other meaning or some other type of action or investigated to understand how did that actually happen? How do we reach into our pant pocket without even looking and know and be able to sift through the objects to figure out which object is actually the key? And then to push the button without even knowing where the, the specific button is uh, in general of unlock or lock and things like that. Pretty amazing those small modes that we're doing in order to unlock the door. And then when you extrapolate that to all those other activities, it's an amazing symphony of data points that we do just to get in the car and back it up in the morning. And the order of magnitude of the reference data points becomes even more extraordinary if one focuses on the micro elements that we just talked about within each of those activities. Um, and then we active, so in that, um, we actively create tremendous amounts of data. And that's pretty clear. Think about how often we blink, every time we breathe, our heart rate, changes in body temperature, how many sounds or words we communicate, noises we make with our hands and feet, etc. Think about the particles in the air, the blood cells in our body, or atomic structure. Data is literally everywhere. It's just now, as technology has evolved, we now have the capacity to articulate that data and sense that data and make some, and then after we sense the data and we are able to say that this happened, we can maybe make some type of correlations to what's going on with those data sets and figure out what's going on on a higher level. And maybe once again, attach other things to that. You know, for example, a Siri uh, is able to take the data of your voice use digital signal processing to understand the meaning of the words you're saying, and then turn on or off your lights, right? Um, or turn on and off your TV and things like that. Or maybe your Fitbit is sensing your own personal temperature, and then it's going to turn on the air conditioning in your house or something along those lines. So the way that data can correlate with other objects is pretty amazing. And how data plays a role in our daily existence even without those sensing things is pretty awesome too. So to receive further perspective on the many areas of available data, view the following infographic of data points that occur every minute on the internet. And this is actually a little bit older of a um, presentation or a, a infographic. But I think that uh, makes it better if anything, because it's just even more staggering and it's outdated. And now it's uh, probably 10 times this or 20 times this or 100 times this. Yeah. Do you, do you have any other things to add? I mean, uh, as we know, Josh Dickinson is an expert on digital signal processing. Uh, <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> There's not many true experts on it. It's pretty complicated stuff. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the big theme of this class is just learning how to, I mean, many classes right but breaking down things into smaller and smaller steps and it gets amazing because there's an old old phrase you know it's turtles all the way down uh which i think came from a greek legend or something about how the the world is on a turtle that's what's keeping the world afloat and then someone asked well what's below that and they said it's a bigger turtle well what's below that oh it's a bigger turtle <clears throat> so the phrase is it's turtles all the way down but any task is like that um 
you know, with reaching into your key pocket and you could break that down into changing the direction of your hand. You could break that down into, you know, changing the acceleration of your hand, which would change the speed of your hand, things like that. So uh, a lot of design will be nested uh, kind of fractal patterns of maybe a grid at this system, which leads to a larger grid, which leads to a larger grid. And then the data within that itself could be nested. Um, so it could be dizzying, but you can stop whenever you want arbitrarily, which is what's kind of nice about that. And uh, it will serve to be a good practice. If you're ever in doubt, you can go down a level, go up a level, um, kind of like hopping between different layers of abstraction in these designs. Yeah, and they're entry points for discovery, essentially, right? Like some person might be looking at a blank piece of paper and think, I don't know what to do, right? And now we're illuminating the millions of different ways that you can go and look at these processes. And a lot of that just starts but with focusing on a single element and choosing that element wisely to start with and then moving in those different directions, right? Um, so this is a breakdown of essentially uh, the different social media sites like LinkedIn, Flickr, Twitter, Facebook, Google, YouTube, and the amount of users before, which was six million, uh, I can only imagine what it is <laughs> now. I would, I would maybe say billion. I, I don't know. I would say it's definitely, it's definitely more than six million. But um, and then it said six hundred and thirty-nine thousand gigabytes of global IP data transferred, which is, I'm sure that's. Uh, that's definitely, and if that was in the hundreds of thousands, it's definitely in the millions and beyond. Do you remember this when this graphic was from? You know, I I don't remember when it was from, so I'd have to look it up. Uh, for, we yeah, should do that. Uh, we should do that in other classes. Uh, yeah, we should check check in on it and see what the difference. Is. Yeah, and it says in 2015 it would take you five years, and the, what would it be like? You know, now that we're in 2021, so. Uh, and I think another point uh, that you were talking about as far as all these different elements that we're referring to, what happens when you replace those elements with something else as well, right? And thinking about that is we go through this whole process, but what if one of those things gets swapped out with something else? How does that change the entire paradigm of our actions, right? How does that change the entire discovery process that leads to innovation and things like that? So thinking about those nodes and those granular nodes and their chain along the path of discovery. And then as artists or designers, you know, pl playing a role of swapping them out and throwing something else in and then seeing how that would change things. For example, what if cement wasn't one of the most used materials in this world and instead they were doing sod and grass? How would that affect everything that we do in the entire environment that that we live in today. Right. Um, and so this is a, um, a comic, <laughs> how's that big data project coming along Hoskins? Um, maybe Hoskinson from Cardano uh, Crypto World. Yeah, um, we're drowning in knowledge now. So how do you think of data? For many people, when they hear of the term data, they imagine something cold, immovable and colorless. One could essentially equate the perception of a data to a gray concrete block. I know we have somebody in this class uh, who is a huge fan of these concrete blocks and thinks it's one of uh, it's something that we should be storing uh, as it might be the only thing that holds value later on uh, when all currency and everything else collapses. Although the general perception of data is banal, data is actually nothing like a concrete block. Data is an adjective or adverb that associates with all the elements of our universe. Hence, data is malleable to its associated, to its associated context of the subject that is referencing. For example, think about the data used to evaluate the numbers of hairs on a puppy's wagging tail or the speed in which the tail is moving. It's hard for the visual of that data to not invoke something that's not positive emotionally in response. So data is a representation that provides substance and context Data is a detail that helps articulate perception of our physical reality. Data provides truth and accountability to our actions that lead to significant discovery. The visual designers provided the authority to select the data that will be associated with the work. The selection of data points are considered data decisions. And, and that gets in to the genesis of what we're talking about here, 
removing one piece of data, putting something else in. That's the role of the designer. That's the creative process of a designer to think about, okay, how could I add complexity to this process of somebody waking up, going outside, starting their car and moving away? What piece of data can I add to that that'll really change the perspective or the lens of which we look at that process, right? What can I infuse in that situation? Data creates, uh, creates structure for the work, otherwise known as parameters for the work. And parameters are the blank spaces where the designer selects meaningful emphasis. And so that's what we're talking about here. What are the parameters of discovery that we're looking for? Um, and then we get into a term that we have kernel vapor and oil, which we'll cover more of next week. In this week, we wanna just kind of narrow down on parameters and data and think about how the materiality of the selection of that data impacts artwork, perception, and things beyond that. So uh, let me move over to uh, a website that we have to go over today. Is there anything uh, that you would like to add to any of that stuff while I'm uh, searching for this? No, I'm enjoying, uh, looking forward to this website. Uh, just to say breaking down steps too, can, it might sound like we're adding complication and it's actually uh, making things more daunting and overwhelming, but it can be the complete opposite where if we break things down, say you have a blank piece of paper and you have to make a full design. Well, that's very daunting. But if you keep breaking that down into the first task, um, you know, into smaller and smaller chunks, it becomes very much not daunting. So you could say, oh, well, what's the first task? I need to just divide this into a few sections. Okay, we'll divide it in half. If you divide it in half and then that leads to the next step and the next step. So breaking things down uh, can actually reduce complexity because it makes it simpler to tackle each individual task. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's, it's really well said. So, okay, so this site uh, is dedicated towards materiality and it's dedicated to some of the artists uh, that we really love and appreciate and really have impacted us visually uh, and conceptually over the years. Um, and so each one of these steps has a question uh, that we'd like you to answer in context of looking at those artists. So for example, the first question is, what do you value? And this is a general question. Please answer uh, the thoughts that come immediately to the forefront of your thinking. Provide us with five things that you value and add a sentence for each value and why they're important to you or beyond. Um, you don't have to get too personal. You don't have to reveal anything you don't wanna reveal. It's just an exercise to start thinking about value systems and value chains. And as a matter of fact, if you wanted to, you could choose another person, entity, animal, anything else, and use them as the basis to answering this question too. So please don't feel um, that you have to overshare things that are too personal to you. Okay, so the first Artist that we have is Namjoon Puck. He's one of the pioneers of visual art. Namjoon Puck is a famous visionary uh, in sculpture, performance, and music. This Korean born artist utilized the emerging forms of electronic media during the 20th century as his palette for art and design. Says here, uh, skin has become inadequate in interfacing with reality. Technology has become the body's membrane of existence. Our life is half natural, half technological, half and half is good. You cannot deny that high tech is progress. We need it for jobs. Yet you make, if you make only high tech, you make war. So we must have a strong human element to keep modesty and natural life. And so um, one of the things that he's really well known with doing is taking TVs um, and uh, creating sculpture out of those TVs. And here you could see a TV here that's the shape of the United States and he has neon over that. Um, he has some really cool pieces regarding that. Ai Weiwei, uh, world-renowned Chinese artist and activist. Ai Weiwei will uh, exhibit, uh, this is older, um, a new edition of his Forever Bicycle Sculpture in Toronto, uh, Nathan Phillips Square, 3,144 in interconnected bicycles will form a three-dimensional sculpture, creating an incredible visual effect. Um, 
So these are the bicycles here in reference that are put together to create this amazing abstract form uh, for people to look at, right? Uh, I'd love to see that in real life. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then here's a video to look at as well. Uh, since we're on YouTube, I don't know how far I can go with actually sharing some of this stuff. So uh, check out this. Be nice if uh, we get kicked off for yeah. plagiarism. <laughs> and, and <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time we were kicked off of Medium, but they actually took our content and put it back up, which was I was never expecting. It was great. <laughs> so for this for this piece of work, looking at the bicycles and the work of Ai Weiwei. Define abstract art in a few sentences. Define figurative art in a few sentences. And do you feel the above artwork of Ai Weiwei is abstract art or figurative art? And cite specific examples of imagery, materials, or sensations in relationship to your answer. There's no right or wrong answer, by the way, to this, um, but kind of look up those definitions if you don't know them already or give your best definition and then look at this piece and answer how you, what your answer is in respect to this piece itself. Yeah, we'll talk a lot more about um, figurative versus uh, abstract in this class. It's kind of a recurring theme and it's very important and it's used all the time. And I think uh, the more you kind of keep it in the front of your mind as a designer, uh, the better because whether or not you realize that everyone's always doing that and kind of painting things or drawing things or representing things with different layers of abstraction. Uh, so very realistic versus like these cartoon icons that are very not realistic, like a cartoon heart or something versus a realistic heart, which would look completely grotesque. And so in design, you have to know exactly when to use which one or what's appropriate. And um, if you start thinking about this interplay, you'll start seeing it in lots of other kind of unrelated aspects. I think it's a pretty good uh, sort of mental shorthand to have around. And yeah. To look at art through that lens. Yeah, and I would look at these questions. So the parameters, if you talk about programming and let's talk about a couple terms in, in programming, uh, which are one of the terms is variables. Um, and variables are essentially a parameter that you create and you define in order to create a program. Um, is there something that you could expand in your terms of what you consider a variable to be? And by the way, I could share a document later that goes into depth on this. I always like describe variables as sort of a piece of paper that you can write something on and you could quickly erase it and write something else. It's sort of a, a bookmark almost um, okay. within the code. A yeah. place, an address, a place you could send something or put something. Right, there. but you define the variables in the beginning. So like you'll define that X equals bicycle, let's say, right? Which is mm -hmm. not literal necessarily like that. You'll often do it as a number or something more granular, but um, that's kind of a variable that we would use in programming, right? Um, and then we would put that variable into an algorithm. And when we say that, you would essentially multiply bicycles buy something else or add bicycles to something else. And that's what these questions are. They're essentially like algorithms that you can put your variables or parameters into. So if we're looking at this first question, abstract or figurative art, you could take the genesis of your parameters and then you could use the algorithm of abstract art to create your piece by using the variables in the, or the parameters in the context of how abstract art would be presented. And the same with figurative art. So if I was using a bicycle, if we look at this picture here, if I was using a bicycle in the terms of abstract art, I would take that bicycle and I would remove its form representing exactly like a bicycle. And I would abstract the layer of it so that it's starting to represent something that's um, a little bit more amorphous in its definition and style, right? And then if I was doing it figurative, I would define it almost didactically or very figuratively as, you know, exactly as that bicycle. And so that's kind of the counterbalance between those two algorithms in which you could take your parameters to use, right? I like, I like the way, I like the way you're describing that. Cool. So um, 
let's look at the next artist, which is Christian Marclay. So uh, Christian Marclay is a super, like, if you want to talk about hip artists, I think Christian Marclay is probably the, the hippest old school artist of all time, right? The video artist who sold his piece for the most money in all of history until a few days ago, perhaps. Are you serious? Uh, oh my God. Well, yeah, it's uh, the hours, right? I think he sold yeah, it for- Yeah, how much was that piece that he sold it for? Millions, I believe, but it might've been less than the NFT token. I just yeah, less than people's. Maybe <laughs> but people I think the hours is, uh, well, I'm not gonna knock the NFT token, but the, the hours is probably one of my favorite pieces that's ever been made that I've never actually gotten to see. So but, uh, that's probably what makes it so interesting. And, and he's also one of the first um, turntable artists ever. And he, in um, museums, sorry, there's some cars starting outside. I don't know if you could hear that. Um, but uh, there's some, he used to go into museums and he would take um, records and he would take old records. He didn't even care about them. He would just throw them back into the container and, he, and then he would bring them out and he would use the sounds of these records to create granular songs and stuff like that, mixing uh, on the turntables tables way before even that big uh, rage of turntable artists and DJs later. So right now that symbi symbiosis between music and art doesn't exist anymore. Throughout the 1980s, the galleries became powerful and things got very commercial. People were in the art business to make money and that kind of, and that kind of killed live art. People gave up performances and went back to the studios. I feel now there's a possibility of a return to more ephemeral activities. Maybe it's in time of economic crisis, like the one we're experiencing now, by the way, this is an old quote, but kind of funny uh, and very timely, uh, that people find more innovative and daring ways to make art. Uh, for example, people. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, the experimentation was really happening in clubs like the Pyramid or BB or 8BC, where tons of things were taking place every night. At the time, I was not showing in galleries. I was only performing. Boy, I, I miss those times. I wish I could go back. Yeah. There. Those have been gone for a long time. Um, and then this is his piece uh, uh, with turntable art. So definitely check that out on YouTube later. Um, so the question for this one is, research the term ephemeral. What do you feel the definition of ephemeral is in regards to the art and music practice of Christian Mar Mark Clay? What do you feel is ephemeral in his work? Do some research and find an object or art piece that is ephemeral. What do you choose? What did you choose that uh, is ephemeral, and why do you feel it is ephemeral? So answer that question and think about that. Okay. So then the next person we have is Tara Donovan. Um, we have an article to read about Tara Donovan, but I think I'm just going to talk about her work here. Please read the link to that article check out this video. Um, and I think this is my favorite piece of all time. Um, and this piece Pretty is- Pretty amazing. Yeah, this piece is uh, Tara Donovan's using styrofoam cups, hanging them to the ceiling and building this amorphous design. And uh, you can see more about the link. I give my own definition about this piece, which to me is a amazing metaphorical discussion about uh, the environmental state of our world, where she's using styrofoam cups one at a time, one single element of styrofoam cups and extrapolating a bigger meaning, turning them into an amorphous cloud. And now when you have clouds of styrofoam cups, you could start thinking about the way that our water cycle works that we all live off of, right? And how we're polluting our environments and things like that. She does not, uh, live, she does not uh, say that that's what the piece is about entirely, but to me, that's what the meaning of the piece is. Um, and I think it's, it's amazing. It's uh, spectacular. I also love just thinking about uh, if you were experiencing this in real life and imagine walking yourself into, into that room <clears throat> and standing underneath it, perhaps you look up and, you know, there's just this gigantic thing hanging over your head, actually made out of styrofoam, this problem that is, you know, covering the planet and just weighing over you like a gigantic problem or something that's waiting to crush you. <laughs> so I think sort of thinking about how you would uh, experiencing that or, or 
the the user experience of the art piece and what it would be like to be in that room is also a hundred percent uh yeah the intensity would be huge right i mean it's literally hitting you over the head with the meaning of it if you're in the room with it right um so cool um okay so uh, the question for this is, this sculpture is created by the utilization and accumulation of styrofoam cups. What is the symbolism of using a mass quantity of brand new styrofoam cups, by the way, for the piece, right? They look perfect. What is the metaphorical symbolism of the design of the installation? Now, keep in mind, I'm giving you guys my perspective and our perspectives, but you can come up with your own too. You don't have to necessarily uh, feel that these things mean what we think they mean. So feel free to take another route to explain it in another way. Um, this next artist is Chris Jordan. And uh, his quote is, there's an axiom I live by. There's no art without politics. You either choose to engage in it or you choose political apathy. The ties, this ties in with ideas around real-time performance and feedback. All of my work is meant to evoke a whole bunch of different types of discord between the attraction and repulsion that we feel towards our consumer habits and our consumer lives. Very much in line with the piece before, although uh, Chris Jordan is, is making an example of this and saying that this is his meaning. And you could see this uh, pointillism piece, a very famous piece. It's in, I, I don't remember the, is it called like a picnic or something like that in French? I know it's at the uh, Art Institute of Chicago, um, but uh, then you could, the actual pieces, the pointillism piece. Yeah. Chris Jordan's piece is using uh, Coke cans in order to create that same, that same visual by using Coke cans as pointillism in order to do that, which is just spectacular. It's, it's so powerful uh, and super amazing uh, what he did with that. Um, and, um, and then here's a, a video of Chris Jordan talking about his art. So in each of his works, there's a duality at play, the microcosm of the image of the material, the microcosm of the element that he's choosing, which is the Coke can, um, and then the macrocosm of the image and what it represents, and then the macro scale as these micro objects grow to be bigger. And uh, so it's talking about, we can always look at things on a miniature and dig down or almost on a cellular level, which things get super interesting based off of that. Or you can scale it and you can look at it on a much more larger scale, which has a different type of significance and meaning. So when you take your parameters, you can play with them by looking in the detail of them or the macro, the large scale of them as well, in order to use their meaning in your work or your designs. Uh, so visit the website. Uh, look at the image gallery. Tell us which image you selected. I'll let you finish reading on this one. And then the last one, this building never got built, but it was a spec building um, in a, a design that uh, was an award-winning. Architects have come up with an extraordinary design for a new self-sufficient city made up of organic hill buildings. The cluster of green towers are designed to be home of 77,000 people and also house offices, shops, and schools. They came up with the revolutionary plans in which every floor of every tower is fringed with lush box hedges. And so that's this, there's a link to that. I'll include the link uh, in the YouTube uh, comments and it's on the assignment. It, it's hard to find the link these days. Um, so the question here is what values do you believe are being placed in the architectural design of the Guanggo, sorry if I ruined the name of that, project, those values can relate to the shape of the building, why that shape, what value may they be trying to express, the size of the complex, the location of the complex, the people that will inhabit the complex, and the horticulture as part of the complex, etc. cetera. Uh, research via the web to find a piece of architecture that expresses very distinct values, and then describe what those values are. So. This architecture is borderlining on parametricism, which I think is a really awesome new field of architecture. Um, the cool. And uh, it's algorithmic in nature. And then they're able to build these, these amazing buildings 
uh, out of them. So if you wanted to check out parametricism as well uh, and dig deeper into uh, different types of architecture and the values of architecture, because art and architecture often speak in the same language. They, they use the same tools in order to describe the movements and the development of the things that they're working on. Um, this is the first uh, semester, I, I realized that it's kind of a sad narrative that this utopian green building project never was built <laughs> for this collection of pieces. But nonetheless, there are things like this being built. So it's really high concept. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, we got our first comment from somebody not in this class in another language. Um, if anybody knows, I think it might be French. Um, so, uh, we're teaching around the world. <laughs> so that's awesome. I, I, although I recognize the name, so, uh, but, uh, let us know what that comment is and we'll be happy to respond to it. Um, so, um, yeah. And if you want to check out Patrick Schumacher, who, um, and he was working for, uh, Zaha Hadid, is that correct? Um, and she's, she was one of the most well-known architects for that unfortunately passed away uh, maybe like a year ago or so, right? Um, so check out their buildings, they're, they're really awesome. Actually, I could show one of them as well. Should we show some of those? Uh, That'd be nice. Or anything with the parametric architecture, I don't think it's a commonly known phrase still. Um, so here, I'll share that. And as you can see, like these buildings are just spectacular. I mean, they almost look like they're not possible to make, right? Uh, I think it's kind of a merging of new materials and new ways of building stuff to make this possible. In the past, I don't think it was possible to build buildings like this, but I mean, these, uh, these buildings are just spectacular that they created with, and uh, Patrick Schumacher who worked with Zaha and I um, came up with the term parametricism to describe um, their motivations and the way that they design stuff. Um, so really cool stuff. Check that kind of stuff out. Um, I think we definitely need more buildings like that. They, they inspire. Yeah, we could use them. What's beautiful about it too is it's sort of, uh, you know, very early buildings built by humans have these organic kind of flowing form, lots of curves, because that's what you could build with sticks that were bent and clay covering things and adobe and all that. And then we had to build with these standardized materials. So you build squares, you build angular things. Uh, and I'm no architect, so this is like a horrible summary, but um, you know, now with computers, we can finally build these beautiful, complex, organic shapes uh, with modern materials. So it's sort of this new thing that wasn't possible or would have been prohibitively expensive yeah. 20 or 30 years ago, but now it's becoming commonplace or a little bit more so. Yeah, I think still expensive, but uh, definitely worth it, right? Yeah, um, I it, think so. Yeah, I mean, cities make, you know, architecture makes cities, right? People go to cities just for their architecture and sculpture. So, you know, San Francisco, they come for the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So, um, so architecture, sculpture, uh, amazing structures bring people and uh, to build a building like that will definitely get, well, it get me wanting to go to, to it for sure. So um, then the next artist, another one of the greats, uh, Chris Burden. Um, Chris Burden has in the name of his art been shot, nailed to the top of a Volkswagen Beetle and set on fire. He has crawled naked across broken glass, starved for 11 days on a desert island and stuffed himself into a student locker for an entire work week. Burden 62 originally trained as a sculptor at the University of California, Irvine, but the realities of his life in the 70s forced him to exploit the most accessible raw material himself. And uh, there's, I think they're, they're updating LACMA, but uh, LACMA has this piece and a bunch of his pieces there and they're spectacular. If you ever get a chance to see them in person, I highly recommend it. This is called Metropolis 2. Um, and once again, play it. 
Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to play it yet here, but it's essentially a moving piece where cars are simulating uh, the urban center and you just hear them clicking and clacking and moving around. It's a spectacular piece, um, both for young and old. And, and that's kind of where the question comes in that we have, which is after watching the video, describe your feeling and the impact that the sculpture has on your senses via sound, visual scope, and personal connection. There's no way not for this not to evoke something for, I think for definitely an American, I would say, somebody growing up in the culture of America, because these toy cars are the things that we, many of us played with as kids, but then also just the sound of it, being there and listening to it move around and uh, the noise pollution of the piece and then the scope of the piece, taking a small thing that looks like a toy and making it huge. You know, so it's uh, it's really it's really a powerful piece on that. So have a child, 13 years old or under. We were asked like, I don't have a child 13 years old or under to ask this. So just ask somebody else for their opinion. Ask them to to uh, to harness their childlike instincts to to answer it potentially. Um, yeah, and, this this one this one is uh, it's almost surprisingly powerful it's interesting i mean there's something supernatural about it you know but otherworldly because we've played with these toy cars many of us when we were children but to see something this complex built with those same toy cars it's just unnatural you know uh it's an entire metropolis built with them and i can go on but i don't want to kind of interpose myself but definitely it's one to show to someone else and see how your reactions differ or overlap i would say yeah. What, what's evoked from you? You know, what are those parameters that you're thinking are being exhibited by this piece? Um, and if you'd like to go above and beyond, you could ask a baby boomer uh, as well. So you could ask young and old or ask somebody to think or and think with somebody else about young and old and how they would react to it. So those are our pieces to share with you today and for you guys to answer. And we're really looking forward to seeing what your answers are. And uh, that's pretty much what we have for you today. Does anybody have any questions in the YouTube? Oh, thanks, Lena. Yeah, that's, that's what the name of the piece is. That's awesome. Okay, if not, everybody have a great week. Uh, this was fun for our first graphic visualization streaming and uh, We'll see you guys next week. See you guys later. Nice.